that China is powerful and insecure. As the feature of rampant misconception. India and China cannot go to war. That informal summits has its own limitation. Welcome to the China Dialogue Series, Dr. Tiwari. It is indeed a pleasure to have you in this focus. You are one of India's youngest or one of the young scholars on China. And we would like to have your views on India-China relations with the perspective of present and the future because you are the future of India. The purpose of this talk is that we will generally want to assess and analyze the broad contours of India-China relationship. What is the current situation and what is the future? Are there things where we can work together and mutually for the benefit of both the countries? Generally, it seems that India needs China, China needs India, but somehow it is not happening. You know, like India and China, we are neighbors. We are our oldest civilizations. Probably we had centuries old relationship through Buddhism, through culture and through businesses and all. But somehow, after all this, we just do not see the kind of a too large growing developing neighbor should be. So how do you characterize the India-China relationship today before Galvan? How do you see it? Thank you, Professor. Thank you for having me. And uh, it is indeed a very, very important juncture in the context of India-China relations. If we look at uh, the relations in totality rather than, you know, just a very momentary kind of analysis, we would see that for a while, Sino-Indian relations have been very much uh, influenced by what we can say uh, as the feature of rampant misconception on either sides. And the misconception has historical roots on the one hand, but it is also a very contemporary phenomena because decades after decades in the India-China kind of policy interaction, we've seen that a uh, lot of very good initiatives have not really borne the kind of results they should have owing to this rampant misconception that we have seemed to harbor on either sides. And this in some way points towards a lack of trust when I say a lack of trust, the most fundamental cause of this lack of trust is perhaps the inability to see each other in a holistic manner in terms of their roles in the regional level, in terms of their roles in the international level, and therefore uh, comprehend each other's you know, international perspectives. So I would go back to that entire whole thing as to how you know, in 1947, India was looking at itself in the region, in the world, and how China was looking at itself in the region and in the world. So even though there might be a kind of parity which gives them a solidarity coming from, you know, third world kind of scenario, uh, coming from global south solidarity perspective, at the same time, vis-a-vis -vis each other, they haven't been able to read each other's intentions very well. And this has somehow percolated in a very continued misconception kind of perspective for each other. And this is very well reflected in the foreign policies of either countries when it comes to looking at each other. Every step from India is seen as a step countering China and vice versa. So when we look at China's foreign policy from India, uh, the growing perception is that this is quite anti uh, you know, India or this is not really sensitive to Indian interest and so on and so forth. I would just ask you, what is it that India sees that China's actions are not in India's interest? Since you uh, mentioned pre-Galwan phase, let's go back to, you know, the whole idea of BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Initiative. Uh, the fact that India did not join Bel Belt and Road Initiative was owing to this whole idea that BRI in itself does not represent enough of a tradition. It, it doesn't have enough traction. Indian policymakers in Indian policymaking circles, uh, because of the fact that it, it is seen as, or it was seen as, very hegemonic uh, expansion of China in the region, and uh, the fact that BRI was not giving enough transparency in terms of the dealings that the participants would have vis-a-vis -vis China, and. Later Later on, it in some sense partially came true in the context of the debts that were associated with BRI projects that were unfolded in, uh, say, Sri Lanka or other Central Asian countries. And the fact that Indian uh, policymakers showed a lot of reluctance in joining it purposely because they felt that China was growing out of its region. It was uh, intervening in the regional uh, influence sphere of India and so on and so forth. What kind of intervention or intervening in other countries' uh, domestic affairs? Uh, where do you see China doing it? 
not me personally, but I would uh, fall back to the analysis that uh, the policymakers and uh, other uh, China observers have been pointing out. The fact that uh, the transparency that, that is required in terms of dealing, uh, in terms of uh, uh, taking out certain projects in countries, say in Africa, in the African continent, or in Central Asian republics, or in South Asia, if you take the example of Sri Lanka, the way things uh, came out in the end did not really bode well for the other side when it comes to dealing with China. So uh, probably a lot more transparency was required and uh, the two sides in their case might have not really seen it in the beginning. But in case of India, when it comes to a joint project or a joint venture, probably these are the things which are really debated a lot because of the kind of state we have with each other in, in political relations arena. So this lack of transparency is something that does not really bog down a joint project between India in China, but it might, in, in case of Sri Lanka and China, because they might not see things at the outset the way we do uh, on this side of the border. So interventions, when I say probably the way profits have been shared or probably the way uh, countries in got the debts accumulated on them, uh, thinking that these were not fair terms of trade in the hindsight, these were some of the problems that originated so far as certain projects of BRI are concerned. I just want to, want to ask you, I'm sorry to interrupt you at this point. Like when we say that, that on BRI, that China was not transparent, there were countries who are signing without really reading between the lines. We say that, you know, they are these countries are going to have under debt or they will, might have a long term issues and all those things. But, and this is what, what India, apart from the CPEC, the CPEC was part of Pakistan and there was a political issue and we had a very genuine reason to, to raise issues about CPEC. Uh, I can understand that. But do we think that, like, if Kazakhstan or 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 uh, Sri Lanka or some some African country, they are signing an agreement with China, and they do you think that they do not have economists or do do not have visions or they do not have advisor to tell them that what to sign, what not to sign, and why should we be? I mean, are we kind of savior of all the world that what China is going at other places at the cost of our relationship? Just tell me. No, I completely agree with you. And which is why I said uh, that this is not really a personal uh, perspective on this. If you come to my personal perspective on BRI, I feel that India missed the bus. Uh, it was very much possible to negotiate on the terms that India wanted, but to not be on the same table as to even uh, sort of negotiate for the terms and conditions that one wanted is not a good beginning. So in that sense, I do feel that BRI was something that we sort of missed and uh, the fear in case of India, as I pointed out earlier, would be unfounded because I'm sure we can cover all quarters. Uh, so far as the fact about Central Asian countries, you said Kazakhstan or other African countries or a uh, country in South Asia itself, South uh, Sri Lanka, the kind of deals they sign is probably a reflection of uh, the interest groups that are operating um, behind those deals. And they might have certain very short term interest in their uh, mind, or they might have very parochial interest in their mind and which may lead to all of these accumulated problems of corruption, of financial non-transparency or unfair loan conditions in the long run. So the kind of interest groups that are operating behind these deals in these uh, partner countries of China, one doesn't know about them. Uh, so all of these fears of debt traps and negative social or environmental impacts because of those deals are reflective of the kind of conditions that these particular countries have. Put the entire blame on one party is not something that, that one is trying to do here. Yeah. But the the fact that uh, this also gave a lot of negative credition to China in terms of BRI because this was China was the leading partner in any of these projects. So when the blame game is played, it's also unfairly uh, the larger share, share is also given to the larger partner. So in that sense, uh, BRI did not really gain a lot of positive traction. In fact, it had a lot of negative traction so far as China's doing influence. How do you say it is a, in a negative direction? I mean, every year, the number of countries who are signing is increasing, the investment is increasing also simultaneously. 
But some of, I'm not a votary of uh, BRI or we are this, or this discussion is not about defending BRI. This discussion is more about India-China relations. But I'm just saying that we create perception based on some kind of other reports or by somewhere else. You know. But if you look at the BRI, what I see is that, you know, number of countries are increasing. There are more and more countries are signing it. More and more investment is happening. Or well, maybe not at the same speed. And there are some, strong, I mean, problems in some of the projects in BRI. But it happens in all those projects. My issue is that why India is bothered that what is happening in BRI and why do we have our, I mean, perception of a particular thing we are not involved and is spoiling our relationship. You don't want to join BRI, well and good. I mean, you have your own reasons. But why we have to be party to some third country having problems and all those things? I completely agree. Again, because having an investment of uh, around 500 billion USD in projects ranging to ranging in different countries, like at least 50 countries joined within the period of 2013 and 18 uh, BRI. So sitting on the fence and then uh, pointing out the problems in the entire game that is being played is First of all, it's not really a good, you know, strategy so far as India's economic interests are concerned. And the fact that the shadow of the negative impacts of BRI on certain countries should befall the bilaterals of India and China. Again, that's not a very good strategy. I agree. But all of these arguments are played over and over again to sort of disalign oneself from the region and disalign oneself from uh, China in that sense. Because I feel that a lot of interest lobbies uh, operate in that regard as well. And when I say that these voices gain a lot of traction and therefore a negative image of China is played out again and again in the, uh, you know, Indian uh, public sphere, in Indian, in the making of Indian public opinion. It probably propels India's overtures to seeking out different partners other than China, other than the regional partners as it were, and becoming part of uh, larger alliances. And I would point out Quad in that sense to you, because Quad is not really a regional alliance it has extra regional power and the fact that one feels today we see the public opinion we see the scholarly your, writing your point that, that india is raising these voices is more for a larger interest and to attracting larger partners or cooperation collaboration with other countries you know. so I mean, do you think that between india and china discord order is not really the main issue and it is something else as i said i did not say border being the root cause of misconception. I said that it's basically the image and the role that both India and China are trying to chart out for themselves in the regional and international arena. That does not sit well with either. One does not understand where, you know, when they are sitting in China, they don't understand where India is coming from and vice versa. And this is the continued misconception or misperception about each other's image in the international and regional level that feeds into all of these existing problems. Problems, be it border, political economy of the region, or uh, at large world economy. This continuing thread of misperception, which feeds into this distrust, which feeds into this vicious loop of being constantly on guard regarding each other's uh, policies uh, and initiative. That is something which is the problem. Uh, border is one of the problems. It's not the problem. For me. As I see, like, uh, as a you, as a young scholar and who has been studying Southeast Asia and China also, and you're also teaching students, I mean, which, which are really young. These are the students who have not really seen 1962 or who do not remember, like my generation. We were we remember 1962, we have and we read it in the history books, we have seen movies and all. How does the young generation see a China as our competitor, adversary, or neighbor, or enemy, or, or what is it? I would bring to table two words here. One is definitely competitor, because uh, if you talk to the young generation, and uh, again, uh, there are demographic uh, differences, what kind of young generation you're talking about, but irrespective of their demographic background, uh, most of the youths that I have ever interacted with or the people who actually come to me for certain kind of discussion on, on these topics, uh, they opine that uh, they see China as a very big competitor because first and foremost, 
thing to do is perhaps to learn a lot from China. Even if you don't like the fact that the Chinese are excelling in it, there is uh, still a lot of promise to the fact that, okay, Chinese did it in this way. And can we actually learn from it? Because see, today they are beating us at the border or there is a problem at the border or we want to beat them at the border. Whichever you know uh, quarter these young people are coming from, they would say that, okay, China has achieved something. And we began our journeys almost in the same uh, around the same time. This is where they are and this is where we are. We would want much more. What can we do? So the first thing that comes into mind is a competitor, a competitor who has excelled in a lot of quarters and there is a lot to be, there is a lot of catching up to do. The second thing that of course comes is that this competitor is not really friendly. There is an adversarial image of China that is played out through different uh, mediums of public opinion uh, through different at different junctures the way india and china have interacted including at the border feed into this whole idea of an adversarial uh, competitor not really a very stark enemy or a very close friend or as a neutral country but as an adversary and adversary that can you know have a kind of conflicting attitude in different realms of our uh, interaction as it were so this is my sense of the younger generation they don't point china they don't point out at china being the enemy country they point out uh, point out at china being the competitor who's doing much much better than what we are doing in certain you know areas and how, what can we do there is a sense of competition and there is also a sense of taking China as an adversary, which can grow to a very disproportionate, you know, aspect of, say, what happened in Galwan in the last year and uh, looking at border conflict in that adversarial uh, sort of image. But cooperation with China is possible because of the kind of comparative advantage that we might offer each other. And that's also a very strong belief of the young generation. Yeah, this is very important. So they also... I see there is a scope for cooperation and there is a scope for learning from China. China, whatever they have uh, learned over the time or have achieved over time. This is this is encouraging, but you know, if they are looking for cooperation, but generally if you see that uh, lately that I interact with China and the China perception. Earlier, I mean, all those years, I did not see the Chinese, the general public had really much to say or think about, about India, except that it's a fascinating country, it's a big country, a lot of scope for business and all those things. But lately, I also see a lot of negative feelings in their websites and their, you know, writings and all those things and all. And why do you think this perception has changed? Because our attitude toward China, uh, the India's attitude, the people's attitude toward China has not changed. It was always like that. It was not really so for China, you know. But suddenly China has changed uh, their attitude towards India pretty drastically. Why it has happened? You have been to China, you have been with the Shanghai uh, Institute. What do you think? Well, my sense is that uh, today the Chinese people also see their role and image in the international arena very differently. Uh, they do see the long road that they have traveled and they know what, where they stand. And in that particular context, when there is an incident at the border or when there is this, these are two strong states also, government-wise, if you look at India and China, uh, these are pretty strong states in the sense that the kind of perception they want to sell to the public, they are able to do that. And both within China and within India. So uh, if certain policies are not being played out uh, their way when it comes to a bilateral and uh, if there is something, some kind of public opinion that can be uh, favoring the government because of the kind of response it might have had given to the other side, uh, the government would play upon it and would be very well sell it to the public and public at large would be quite open to accepting that version of the government given the fact that they see themselves as you know the Chinese people in the world at large coming off a Age and also acquiring that place in the world where they feel that uh, terms of negotiation should uh, treat China, if not uh, as someone which is the larger party, but at least as, uh, as an equal. And if a negative perception of the Chinese people is building up somehow on the other side of the border or has always been there, as you point out, that it hasn't really changed. It, this is how we viewed China in the last few decades. That is not being taken very lightly anymore because they feel that their time in history has rather come. And it's it's high time that uh, they be taken more seriously or more favorably. And uh, nobody wants to have that kind of self-introspection. Uh, so it's very much... Uh, and it's not all, one can't lay the blame of all kind of negativities between India and China on China's door. Uh, that's also a fact. 
So all of this misconception across the border, which percolates into their social media spaces, they get to know that the Indians are making these kind of uh, statements or Indian government is on this side of the agreement or disagreement, uh, feeds into this anxiety and also this idea that why should we take India seriously? I have been traveling to China since 2008. And on multiple occasions, I mostly interacted with the, the generation of my age, which is, you know, in mid thirties. Uh, so I started interacting with people when they were in their mid twenties. Today, they are in mid thirties. And, uh, you know, our seniors took their uh, interviews, uh, had a long chat. Some of them, of course, are Indophiles, but still they are not uh, blind to the fact that, you know, Indian people do not really have a very favorable opinion of China. So if they don't have it, why should we extend uh, a favorable opinion why should we invest so much in a, in a relationship which seems to be going nowhere? Uh, that's the sense of uh, the current Chinese populace. And unless there is a huge initiative to build these kind of, you know, uh, grassroots um, interactions, unless there is an opening up of uh, India and China in terms of people to people interaction, that's never going to happen. And people are going to just believe whatever they are fed through media, through public channels, through government channels. Uh, the image of the other is going to stay in that same manner because not, not enough people have explored what the other side looks like on their own. There are very few travelers from India to China. Yeah, but you know, generally there has always been kind of a skirmishes between India and China and hot and cold relationship was always there and all. But this kind of attitude, do you think it has got something to do with this perception or attitude change to a Chinese attitude changing towards India? It has got something to do our probably they, they, they see that we are leaning more towards the West or more towards the USA. And they have a now very hot kind of relationship to going, uh, relationship to China. That's one of the uh, things that when there is a kind of conflict, when there is a, a disagreement uh, at world politics level, where does India stand? Does it really uh, support China or is it going to be always in the opponent's uh, camp as it were? The, the very fact that uh, India and China do not see eye to eye on many issues. So for as regional policies are concerned, gives this kind of uh, idea that India is also not at all cooperating with China. When you look at all of this from Chinese perspective, so it's not really a big of wonder. Yeah. Why we do not see eye to eye? As I said, that there is an immense competition so far as the regional scale. Uh, I think it's more about the image that one carries in the head. Who is leading the global south? That was the competition in the 50s and 60s, you know, when initially Nehru and Mao sort of uh, jostled for that place. And I don't think much has changed even today because how we see ourselves as Indian people, you know, uh, a robust economy as people who are doing so well in the services sector and so on and so forth and may have missed the bus when it comes to industrial expansion, but might jump onto that bandwagon wagon of knowledge economy in some decades. I mean, this is the dream, right, from India. And one wants to be taken very seriously in, in pursuit of one's self-image in that world order. And this self-image in the world order is a burden to bear so far as interaction with each other is concerned. And these are two very big countries. Both have the burden of self-image and they also have a burden of uh, performing in the eyes of others, in the eyes of other world players. In one of your talks in Cambridge, uh, university, you had mentioned, you spoke about the power and leadership in India and China. So uh, what do you mean by it? And how would you characterize the leadership of Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Modi? Because what I see that there have been differences uh, with India and China for the last 70 years, which we have been seeing. But now it is getting more and more intensified, you know, getting more stronger feelings on both sides. And all. Has it got to do with something with the leadership and their style? Uh, yes, I agree. Um, my previous work has actually been looking at a comparative perspective on how power has been taken in, you know, Indian subcontinent and how it has been taken in Chinese context. Um, and in that sense, who has the leadership uh, in South Asia and in East Asia? So, in fact, my doctoral work was looking at China's role as a leader in East Asian uh, regionalism. And I was looking at Southeast Asia and East Asia both together. So, for me, in a in a nutshell, Power in China has been basically uh, enconced in a continuum owing to uh, the 
role of CCP in Chinese politics uh, since 1949 uh, and before that. Uh, whereas in India, power has been placed or it, the site of power has had a lot of fragmentation. There have been phases of a very centralized, strong power vested in authority. And those phases have been ruptured or have seen a fracture with the emergence of coalition politics. And therefore, the nature of power that is there in Indian politics is not a continuum. It has seen kind of fragmentation rise of regional state power, decentralization, so on and so forth. And therefore, the kind of leadership that uh, India would wield in South Asia has been very different from the kind of leadership that China uh, has shown to wield in uh, entire East Asian region. That was the kind of, that was my uh, sort of argument there. Bringing it to the current context, looking at the leadership right now, leadership in China and leadership in uh, India, we know that uh, there are certain common factors between both the countries, the way leadership has evolved, be it Modi, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, hierarchy is strictly followed. Um, there is a decision which is made by keeping the key people at the top of the organization. At the same time, the decision is made by uh, the person with the maximum authority, meaning the supreme leader in that sense. So this is a very uh, centralized notion of uh, strong, powerful leadership that has emerged in both India and China. Now, how much uh, playing field both of them would have because of the centralization of power in themselves, how much would they have in terms of negotiating? How much is it that they can leave open for the other to sort of uh, intervene or influence, that's something that, that has not been easy. If you show yourself as a very strong leadership in the domestic arena, of course, in the foreign policy, the room for maneuver also restricts. It's not as easy to sell a particular decision to your populace back home, to the population back home saying that, oh, I relented. I mean, you would want to show the upper hand all the time. So that's the burden of, a, of being a very powerful centralized figure. If you see that on both sides, Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Modi, they are very strong and very popular leaders on both sides. And to certain extent, the decision making is centralized in the sense probably nobody questions their, 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 their authority on in both the countries and all. But then how come, why this Wuhan and uh, Mahamalipuram, they did not, why it failed, why it did not work? Which is the thing, you know, how much do we leave out for uh, the secondary level or the secondary tier of, as it were, to work out for itself? I mean, the leaders might go ahead, roll out initiative, but the exact amount of work that is required to build that particular initiative uh, and to uh, sort of uh, make it work is actually a work of multiple organizations and uh, cooperation amongst multiple channels of the government, uh, channels of the civil society, channels of uh, multiple channels of the business community and so on and so forth. So unless all of them are brought, it is one thing to do the entire initiative and it is another thing to take it forward. So the taking forward work, either it has to be done by the government or the government has to ensure that uh, accountability and responsibility is given at different levels of all of these means of communication, all of these channels of communication. And if nothing has been do done and it is just an exercise in terms of uh, enhancing one's own immediate leadership capacity and uh, it's just a part of a performativity of leadership and it's not really a long-term task of you know building these grassroots initiatives, then of course it doesn't really uh, bear any significant results. So like we see that there are a lot of issues, a lot of conflicts and a lot of areas of concern between India and China. But you also see that there are a lot of opportunities for cooperation. And it is probably the cooperation is the way that probably both the countries need with each other. And as you were talking earlier about the sense, uh, the sense will belong to Asia. It is strangely has to belong to Asia, but India and China has to work together for that. Uh, so if you have to give one suggestion each to both the countries to, to take this relationship forward, uh, what would it be? Well, I feel that both the countries should invest a lot in uh, addressing the underlying mistrust in relations and have to build up a lot in terms of strong understanding of each other's international positions. And that is how we can sort of come to this whole idea of being rivals in many areas, but at the same time being able to coexist peacefully. In context of, uh, I think China also can sort of aim at, you know, looking at uh, making the first move as it were towards uh, a kind of reproachment with India so far as uh, the current crisis is concerned. And this process is not easy. Uh, it does require a lot of break from our uh, 
the erstwhile characteristics that we've had uh, of our relationship. So it will mean a new start. The beginning can be made from either side, but I think that uh, being the larger adversary, I think it's uh, the more onus is also given at the doorstep of China in, in terms of trying to build that rapprochement and breaking away from the kind of rot that uh, exists in uh, India-China relations. What is the main cause? Just give me one or two main causes of mistrust between India and China. Uh, inability to see each other in, in terms of 